Hello, everybody. Uh, despite the fantastic introduction, my name is Donnie Walls. Uh, you can find me on Twitter with my name. You can find me on my blog with, surprise, surprise, also my name. Uh, I'm lucky to have a name that not many people have, so I can always pick my real name for everything, which is fantastic. In my free time, I like to play the guitar, uh, learn stuff, and share some knowledge like I'm doing today. Um, and I won't be doing that just today. Um, I had this crazy idea recently that in December I was going to write one article every day on my blog in December. I'm not regretting it yet. I'm slowly getting there. Eventually, I'm sure I will regret it. But then I have Christmas, so it's going to be great. Uh, you can follow it uh, on my blog or hashtag Advent of Swift. And the reason I'm here today is to tell you a little bit about building reusable components with generics and protocols. Just a quick show of hands, who here is super confident that they know everything they need to know about protocols, associated types, generics, all that stuff? <laughs> Great. There's only one. You want to do the talk, Antoine? <laughs> OK, so uh, my goals for today are, first of all, to teach you a little bit um, how you can design code that uses generics, because that's a little bit different than how you would maybe normally write your code. Also, to teach you a little bit about simple generics and associated types. Next, uh, know how to use your protocols with associated types, because knowing that they exist and that you can do things with them is one thing, but putting them to good use is something completely different. And lastly, um, I hope to either blow your mind or not do it too much, or not at all, or really I just hope you learn something and that this all clicks in the end. So, like I said in the beginning of this talk, I sometimes have crazy ideas. This was one of them. I want to have a cache, and it should be able to cache just about anything. And as if that wasn't crazy enough, I wanted it to have a remote backup. So it should have something locally, and if it's not there, I can take it from the server. And if that data is taken from the server, I want it to be cached locally. And I also don't want to create special managers or stuff, or just don't want to create one thing where I can put whatever I already have as a local store and a remote store in it. Um, it's me in the morning before I realize what I <laughs> am about to get myself into. Uh, the appropriate reaction would have been this, and then to get coffee, sit down, think about it, and do something else. My reaction was this. I mean, why not? So I started off designing the call site for this cache thing. Um, so how do I do that? I, first, I figure out like, what it is that I'm trying to build and how I want to use this thing. Like, how am I going to write code that utilizes this complicated thing that I'm building? The reason I do that is it helps me validate my ideas. It helps me see that what I'm about to build is actually going to do something, and it's going to be useful, and it's going to work, hopefully. And at that point, I'm not worrying about generics yet. I am doing something that is just about as high level as the description in the beginning, is I want to have something that can do pretty much anything. So I go on, and I write some code. It's not real code. It looks kind of like what I would want to use. And you can summarize this as just an easy, straightforward API. I have a local data store, a remote data store, and then another data store, which is really the cache. Uh, and I can fetch something and get a result. Simple. So how would I implement that? And it's still sort of in a designing phase. Like, this is not real code. This is probably going to be thrown away at some point. But I'm imagining some class or struct or whatever, and it's going to have two properties, a local and a remote store. And it's going to have a fetch method. And that is going to use the local store to find an object. If it cannot find it, OK. We'll go to the remote store. And if it finds it there, we're done. So far, so good. But this isn't the actual thing, isn't it? You might be thinking that. It's not good, because you were promised generics and possibility of getting your mind blown. So before I do that, um, let's take it step by step. Look at generics first. Put your hand up if you have never seen any code like this. Good. Uh, this is creating an array. And that right there is a generic. 
it's an array that is generic over string. So if you would look at what an implementation of an array might look like, it could be this, array with a generic property t, where t could be anything. It's a generic placeholder. It's a made-up type. And it's always put between angle brackets. So angle bracket open, your generic, close it. So let's think of something we, something very simple we could do with generics. We could make a specialized printer. It's generic over t, and it has a method print, and it takes an object, which is of type t, and it prints it. Now note that the generic defined on the type, t between angle brackets, and the one that is given to the print function have to be the same. You cannot change them. Once you determine that t is a string, it's forever a string. Once you determine that it's an integer, it is forever an integer for that instance. So using it might look like this. We're generic over string, so we can print hello, that's fine. Printing 10 is not fine because 10 is an integer, it's not a string. So we can specialize our specialized printer as we want. And the compiler will enforce this for us. So this allowed you to make a very both flexible but also constrained specialized printer that you can print anything with as long as it's known at compile time. So that is a very contrived example. Let's look at something a little bit more real. If you're doing MVVM in your app, you might have a view model that's very simple. It has a list of items, and you can get the number of items in that list, or you can get a specific item based on an index path. Uh, I myself have written this at least once, maybe twice, maybe 20 times, probably more like 20 times. And using generics, you can make this simpler, or at least less duplicated, because they're very similar. Now, this is much nicer, I think. It does basically the same. It's a view model that's generic over t. It has a list of items of type t. You can still get the count. You can get an item with an index path, and it will return an item of type t to you. Very good. And it's also easy to use, because you can just make a view model between the angle brackets. You say t is now a user, or t is now a product. And you can use them just as you would your non-generic view models. OK, great. So based on this, we can take step one into building our cacheback data source. I'm just going to define a struct cacheback data source. We do a struct because we should always start with a struct if we don't need a class. And we make a generic over t. And also note that we have result type of t. Now, if you think about this one for a second, you might realize that optional t is also a generic, because it's optional generic over t. Result is also generic. That's the result generic over success and failure. And we're using that in a generic cacheback data source. So now we're getting somewhere, I think. It's generics and generics and generics. It's very flexible. OK, so that's one thing. Um, what else did we need? Oh, yeah, remote and local data sources. So we're going to define some protocols for that. Two protocols, fairly straightforward, a local store. It can find and persist objects, and a remote store that can only find objects. They're generic over T. But yeah, we cannot do this. And the reason is that protocols don't have generics like concrete types do. It's impossible to add T to a protocol declaration, and so we also cannot use T as a type for methods. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to use associated types. An associated type is defined like this. And it can be used to define placeholder types. It's very, very similar to what you can do with generics, because it's still made up types. Stored objects and target object are not a real thing. But they're associated types. So they are very similar to what a T or a generic parameter would be. We also have these results. Uh, there used to be result t when we first tried to use t, which didn't work. So now there are result stored object and result target object, and of course, error cases. So they're almost used as if they're real types. And this defines two very powerful protocols. So how do we implement these protocols? How do we make an object that conforms to this? Well, what we can do is just define a struct for the array-backed user store, which is the local version, or a remote user store. And as you can see, we're using result user here. 
an object user, and then another result user. And the Swift compiler understands that when we do this, what we really mean is that instead of having this you know, target type or stored object type, we are using user as a real type, concrete type for that. So this is uh, replacing whatever the, the associated type was with a concrete type. And also note that the same type must be used again. So just like we had with T, we cannot make T something in the definition and not something else in a method. Once we determine that stored object is a user, it has to forever be a user. So here, both persist and find must use the same type. Let's rewind a little bit, though, because currently, anything can be our associated type. Literally anything. So for our remote data store, it could be a UI image, which might be strange because our remote data source might not necessarily always want to return a UI image. So yeah, that's a bit of a problem. We cannot really work with that all the time. And I know I promised that we would cache anything. I'm going to pull back a little bit. We're not going to cache anything. All we want is that it's decodable. So what we do is we. Uh, make the associated type a little bit more specific. And we say that target object in a remote store can only be the target object if it conforms to decodable. We do that by how you would do it in any other place, just colon decodable. And the compiler will enforce this. So if we try to use a user here and the user does not conform to decodable, the compiler will throw an error at us. OK, so far so good. So what do we have? We have a cacheback data source that's generic over T that has a find method that calls a completion handler with a result of T and error. We have a local store that has an associated type of stored object. And we have a remote store that has an associated type of target object and decodable. So at this point, we have pretty much everything we need to start assembling our super flexible cache. So let's do that. We put everything together. We have a cacheback data source with T, local store, remote store, and the find method. This looks very similar probably to what we had in the beginning where we sort of defined what cacheback data store would look like. This is very, very nice. OK, maybe not really. This does not compile. Um, because our protocol now has a type, uh, an associated type, the compiler does not understand that if we say that we have a let local store that has to conform to local store, it's, it's confused because it doesn't know what the associated type is going to be. So we need to do something here. What we can do is specify that we have not generic type T in our cacheback data store, but instead we're going to have a, a generic type local and a generic type remote. And we're going to say that these generic types have to conform to local store and remote store. Now the compiler does understand this, and the reason is that at the point that it has to determine what is local or what is remote, it will be able to take whatever we are trying to pass as local or remote and it will be able to infer what the associated type is going to be. So by doing it like this, saying that we have some type local, and it's going to be a local store, and the rest we'll specify later, the compiler can now accept this and be happy. And also note that we can use local.storedObject as the result type of our find method. Because when we find something, or when we try to find an object, we want it to match something in our local data store. At least that's the first thing that we want. So if we find it, then whatever we get back from result is the object that we have stored in our local store, whatever that may be. We don't know at this point. All we know is that it should all add up in the end. So let's write the implementation for this. And you might notice that it's pretty much exactly what we saw in the beginning. It's a local store. Where we can find an object, and that will return us a result of local.stored object. So if you find that, great. We can call the completion handler. Now, remote store is used as a backup, 
but let's think about this line for just a second. Let me help you with a little flashback. Our remote store has an associated type of target object. So when we call find on the remote store, we get not the local store.stored object, but we get remote store.target object. So, yeah. How do we match that? Because the compiler can never be sure that we're going to cache the same thing that we're trying to fetch from the remote, right? Like, these are completely separate. So this really cannot be used the same way. So this is a problem. How are we going to fix this? Luckily, it's not too much work to fix this. So what we can do is we can constrain the protocols associated types. So what we can say here is that whatever we give to cacheback data source as a local store has to have the same stored object as the target object of the remote store. If these don't match, the compiler will throw an error and tell us that they're not the same, so it cannot enforce that these are always going to work. So we have to fix that. So now if we go back to this line here, we can persist a local store, uh, we can persist the remote store's target object in the, remote, in the local store because the compiler can now enforce that whatever they work with is the same. Okay. And of course, we can also, once we find the object, call the completion handler with remote store target object, even though we really wanted the local version, but they're the same. So that's great. So how do we use this? I mean, at this point, you're probably thinking this is looking very complex, it's probably not easy to use, and I would never ever want this in my code base. Well, it looks like this. Pretty much identical to what I wanted to write, because I have a local store, I have a remote store, I make an instance of the cacheback store, and I can just use find. And what's a lot of fun is that I can also use the user. So go over it again real quick. Rayback store confirms the local store. We know that local store dot stored object is a user in this object. Then we have a remote store that conforms to our remote store protocol. We know that the target object is user. We know that user is decodable, so that's also fine. So we can make our instance. So for the cacheback data, uh, cacheback data source, we know that it's local generic is going to be an Rayback user store. We know that the remote is going to be the remote user store, and the compiler can infer all of this, so we do not need to specify these generics on the cacheback data source ourselves. And also note that because the compiler knows that our arrayback data store has a user as its uh, stored type, that the result in our result um, type will be a user. So to you as somebody who's using this cache, you're basically completely unaware that there is a ton of generics and protocols behind this. So yeah. We have our cacheback data source with the local, local store. We have the stored object. We have the user and user error. And so this all circles back to the array back to user store. Then we have the local user store, which is an instance of the array back user store. And that is how the compiler eventually can prove that our result user is there. So just because it all comes back in a circle. OK, so when is all this really useful to know? Well, code, deduplic uh, code duplication, for me at least, is often related to the type system. I want to have several things that are basically the same, but not quite. And they have to do similar things, but also not entirely. Generics are usually a good way to clean that up. You're most likely to encounter these in your model or networking layer. I find that in the UI, it's usually a lot more specific. But when you're building something for networking or data stores, it's often useful to have something very generic. And also, if you want to write frameworks or SDKs, this is pretty much essential because you want those to be flexible, stable, and robust. So in summary, First, 
figure out how you want to write your code. If you, want to, if you know how you can use it or how you want to use it, it's very nice to have that drive your implementation. So basically work from the outside in instead of the inside out. Find out what it means for implementation. So if you know what you're going to use it like, you can work your way back and see how you need to implement this. If needed, introduce generics, protocols, or other abstractions that you need. Use constraints where needed so the compiler can help you infer everything. If you don't want to do this, you could just as well use any for everything, and Swift will always be happy, and your app will probably crash a lot because the compiler cannot help you with anything. And lastly, generics can help you limit your code duplication. So one more time, if you like this talk, I'm going to be writing a lot more on my blog. You can follow me on Twitter. You can follow Advent of Swift. And with that, I would like to thank you, and questions are always welcome. <laughs> Any questions? Good question. Um, my opinion is it depends. OK, yeah, so the question is, what is your opinion on using T as the type name for something that is generic versus using a descriptive name? Uh, so my answer is, I think it depends. Um, in some cases, T is kind of covers the load. Uh, you want to make sure that there's no way to confuse it with something that might be a concrete type. Um, and that's also usually, I would usually use that like in, in the insides of the insides of whatever framework I'm building. Um, let's say I would be building something like Swift result type. I would definitely not use like T and U as the success and failure names. Uh, they're user facing, like I want you to, to be able to click on that and see my definition and understand that what I expect as the first argument is success and not T and have you be confused about what T might be. So it depends on context. Anything else? All right. Thank you,